Hello, today I'm going to be reviewing the latest album by Claire Boucher, a Canadian producer, music wizard, as I like to refer to her as, um, aka Grimes. She has really made a name for herself now. She's been around for a little bit. Um, she, you know, came up in the sort of indie electronic scene with her first few albums that she put out in the beginning of this decade. And then she came out with Visions, which was her first kind of big commercial solo album. It was very experimental, avant-garde, and very intriguing. I was introduced to her through her song Genesis and Oblivion. Those two singles were really impactful on pop radio, even though I don't consider a lot of those songs pop, especially Genesis. Um, and they just blew my mind, the visuals and the video. I, I just, her voice was so uncannily strange and yet so beautifully suited to these sort of slightly off pop hooks and melodies. Everything had this dark um, twist and turn in every sort of note and the way the songs were composed. The production and the synthesizer work was just exquisite. When I found out that she basically is a one woman team, you know, she is her own producer. She's her own songwriter. She is her own mixer in some respects. Um, although she does have someone come in and help mix this latest album I'm reviewing, which is called Art Angels. It was released on November 6th of 2015, um, digitally, and then on December 11th, physically of that year. But Art Angels, you know, was an album that took a long time to come to fruition because she does work by herself and she didn't necessarily get all the credit that she deserved from Visions. Um, a lot of people and reviewers kind of wanted to pigeonhole her as just that pretty voiced singer who couldn't possibly touch any of that complex recording equipment. Um, you know, women don't do stuff like that. She got so pissed and jaded about that. And so I see this album as being so showing in, in their faces how amazingly and immaculately she can produce an album. I think the production almost overcomes the songwriting. This album is just produced so well. I don't know. I mean, there's definitely a lot going on. She definitely did not want to strip anything back. I think Visions was in a little bit more of an ambient direction. This album wants to be a more electronically fueled pop album. And there are some undeniably catchy pop hooks, some of which I was really surprised to hear coming from her. But she did release a song, Go, in 2014, which a lot of fans were annoyed that it sounded like it was pandering to pop radio. It was actually written for Rihanna, but she didn't take it. And I actually really fell in love with Go. And that was a signal to where she was heading with the sort of pop aesthetic. I don't mind that she makes slightly pop sounding catchy choruses, because you know me, I love melody and I love catchy choruses. I will always love pop that's like this. It's not banal pop. You know, it's it's intriguing, it's different, it's dark, it's edgy, but it's also fun and so groovy and danceable. So this album just had me like all over the place. I was just so enamored by it. And I'm just gonna get into it first off. I love the intro, laughing and not being normal. It just is so cheeky and it's so grimes. It's just this short little interlude where she's using some of these beautiful high vocals that I really wish she utilized more. These very haunting, obviously she always kind of, she edits her voice to make it a little bit more synth and a little bit more of a, you know, distinct sound. But her voice can get just so squeaky high and beautiful. And I love the sort of vocal pirouettes that she does on the intro here. And then it sort of comes down in sort of this dark kind of brooding buildup that enters into California, which is the first song. It was a single off of this album. And it's the first big pop song. And it definitely is not my favorite of those pop songs, but it's so undeniably cute and catchy. Um, I don't really know why it's necessarily at the beginning of the album, because for me, this song doesn't necessarily feel like it's strong enough to lead. I feel like it's better placed a little later on. I feel like a song like Art Angels or Flesh Without Blood would have been a better song to put as track number two instead of putting them a teeny bit later in the album. But California has this sort of cute um, faux country aesthetic where she's sort of making fun of the genre, but she's also sort of at the same time parodying the California bohemian culture and at the same time paying homage to it. Um, the music video shows her, you know, in this honky tonk av avenue, which of course, California, I don't think of honky tonk. That would be more Texas. I feel like she kind of rolls Texas and California into one on this. But I also feel that undeniable guitar driven melody, which is so California. And the guitar driven melodies are the strong pop staple of these songs on this record. 
you know, she sings about why'd you make me feel so sad in California. She moved to California, obviously, to try and make it as a singer, songwriter, producer, as everyone does. And, you know, California, it's like supposed to be so beautiful. I was actually just in L.A. I went to California for the first time this past weekend. And I was in Southern California in Los Angeles. and I'd never been there before. And as much as I was so glad to finally go, I can see how the illusion of the glamour of California can fall once you actually realize that there's a lot of parts to that area that are not very nice. There is smog. There is a lot of crime. And there is a lot of, you know, concrete. There were way too many freeways. There is a level of kind of fakeness to some of it. I, it's fun, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. And that's what a lot of these songs are. There's a little bit more of a cautionary awareness hidden beneath some of the tranquil and more kind of aloof, um, playful lyrics and melodies that she incorporates. You know, she she mentions how, uh, you know, California is going to be swallowed up in the ocean. Maybe I'll drown. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, because of the San Andreas, Los Angeles is going to be, you know, off into the ocean in some point in time. And she says, maybe I'll drown in California. Well, it's a metaphor for also maybe I'll drown personally and just the awash style of LA life. Am I going to get swept up in that? Or am I going to stay my unique self who is much more Vancouver, who is much more Seattle and a lot more hipster and quirky and in the art scene? Scream features this Taiwanese rapper whose name is Pan Wei Ju, but she goes by Aristophanes as her stage name. And it's this really dark and brooding kind of almost heavy metal song where she has this really pounding bass guitar, just grungely kind of plodding along and she's wailing and screaming. And then on top of that, Aristophanes is delivering this very kind of sporadic but panicked kind of rap. The lyrics are extremely dark. If you, of course, she's rapping in Mandarin. Um, a scream that hides in the lungs, hides within your flesh and bones. There is no way for a cure. It becomes a disease. Once dry, then dripping wet, swells and is meaty and juicy. At the same time, a woman with her full black hair walks on the mountains in dreamscape. Memories siphon like mosquitoes, open their unblinking eyes like huge half-flared, unlusting nostrils. I've bitten down. Are you still unmoved? You can scream out now, following your spine. My fingers creates an icy lake. Look around, no one's watching. Tear off your jacket and jump in with tears streaming. I want to record your orgasm, but I press the wrong key. Lost time cannot be taken back. Lying pitifully, fighting fluid. Sticky and transparent in my palm, it stays elastic. I can't have enough. I want to milk more from your body. At the time, the telephone rings. Well, I listen to you as I lick off your sweat, bead by bead. The lust and screams that are born. If you can't scream it out, then swallow it down. Heavy, heavy, lustful sexual lyrics talking about also this bitter depression, this bitter kind of despair. And I think that that is kind of, if it was, you know, spoken in English, it would be a little heavy. But at the same time, the song is so heavy and, and it embodies, I want to say that goth emo punk aesthetic, although I hate using the words emo and goth, because I feel like that culture that that conjures up is a little bit misleading. But culturally. Um, but it definitely follows that aesthetic. I, I find it just an undeniable kind of Halloween vampire-esque gothic song. Flesh Without Blood was the lead single off of this. It's that one other big kind of booming pop song. It's not my favorite, as I said, but I do like it a little bit more than California. It has an adorably strange music video where Grimes is all of these different characters, male and female, sort of playing with herself. She's playing tennis the video doesn't actually make that much sense. Um, it was directed by her brother. It, it didn't really need to because the song in itself, if you listen to the lyrics, all the overall, of course, idea is that I don't see what I used to see in you. You're now just a flesh. There's no blood in you. You're hollow. You've sacrificed some essential part of yourself. Again, she could be looking inwards, possibly to selling herself out for fame. A lot of people, when they first heard this song, that was sort of what came to mind because it is so different from the work that she did with Visions. Again, has that grooving kind of guitar-driven melody and pop hook structure that I think she edits beautifully. I think her voice has this beautiful, glossy kind of synthesizer edit reverb on it. And I think that the production, although it is a little cacophonous at times and gets a little overbearing, I do think the song drags on just maybe 30 seconds too long. I do think that it is an undeniably fun song that you don't want to take too seriously, 
because I do think the lyrics are a little vague. I don't really read too much more into them beyond what I just said, because she doesn't provide a lot of specifics. But you do think under the surface there's something, you know, she's stabbing herself in the music video eventually. And so that sort of leads into the like later kind of aspect of this sort of darker angel who is battling with her inner, you know, struggle between the light and the dark. And I see that struggle kind of playing out in the arc of this theme. Remember, Art Angels is a play on Archangels, um, you know, like Archangel Michael from the Bible. Belly of the Beat is another more sort of jovial and at the same time restrained, I would say alluding a little bit to with just some twinges of country and like bluegrass in there. She does have that acoustic guitar, which kind of strums along the melody. And she sort of delivers almost a yodel-like um, chorus where she isn't actually saying any words. She's just pronouncing these syllables. And it's cute. It, it kind of reminds her, it makes her sound a little bit like a chipmunk. Um, and sometimes her voice does sound a little bit like she inhaled a ton of helium. And I think that that is sort of her aesthetic of her voice. Again, she's pitch shifting her voice up quite a lot sometimes in these scenarios. And she's adjusting to make it sound like this squeaky clean, beautiful, but yet crystal clear kind of lilting sound that colors and just flows like liquid so beautifully. Again, the melody might sound positive, but if you listen to the lyrics, it tends to be pretty dark. I could feel the world today. Everybody dies in the point they arise, and we dance like angels too, breaking all you need in the shapes of faith and knowledge of you. The belly of the beat could be surrendering to that lust for just having fun on the dance floor, finding salvation through music and through dance. And I think that that summarizes what this album is kind of doing. You know, she's reconciling some personal stuff that's really dark. She recorded a very dark sort of demo album before this, which a lot of it was scrapped. And I think that that sort of kind of crosses over into the sort of themes, but she she completely adds that wink and that, you know, cheekiness and light, airy bubblegum pop aspect. Um, I don't want to use the term bubble goth because that is Curly's term, but I got to be honest, Grimes' music also does fall a lot into that sort of bubble goth with a little bit of country also included. Bubble goth country, um, bubblegum pop goth country music summarizes it pretty well. Kill versus Maim or Kill v. Maim. Holy crap, this song gets you so hype. It's the most gothic and in your face and over the top song on this record and it needs to be. This song needs to make a statement. It shows exquisite production. It shows, um, I think it shows allusions to K-pop and other big pop songs of like the Spice Girls and turns it all on its head. It's like put through a blender and becomes this maniacal but beautifully criminally good listen. It's so undeniably fun to dance to. Um, she was, she was inspired to like make this song about this like really gothic vampiric character. Um, she was inspired by like the Godfather and like all these sort of gothic horror novels. And she wanted to make it sort of this about this character that's not her, that's a little bit more androgynous. You know, she even says, I'm, but I'm only a man and I do what I can. Grimes does like to play with gender roles and it's something I really love about her image and her aesthetic. She spells out B-E-H-A-V-E. Arrest us Italian mobster looking so suspicious. And so ultimately this action sequence kind of inspired dramatic song is just turning all the tables on the sort of cute aesthetic that some people might have considered Grimes to be. She has a hard, hard cutting, um, almost violent edge to this, which I don't find, you know, vulgar or unnecessary because there's a there's a pointed you know message that she is trying to get across with a lot of these songs, which is don't mess with me and especially don't mess with women, because uh, you know we are not going to take this all lying down. You know she's really confronting a lot of this, and of course this is just a character. This has nothing to do with that in this particular song. But I really do get that angst coming through and that punk sort of aesthetic of rebelling against the system and being its own kind of flipping and subverting kind of construct. And when she declares a state of war, you know she means business because she growls that like the most heavy metal, crazy, you know, rocker that there what there ever is. It reminds me of Emily Autumn. Emily Autumn does something similar where she sounds so sweet and innocent. And then that last line, she just 
she just growls and she makes it the most heavy metal thing. I love it. On initial listen, the title track, Art Angels, just swept me up instantaneously. This one has undeniably the best catchy melody on the album. It's the best pop song. It really is nothing more than that in some aesthetics. It's euphoric and it's, again, not something I look too deeply into lyric-wise. I do get a little bit of California, kind of that beach aesthetic of like, those fun sort of surf seller melodies that you hear. It, it just embodies a lot of that. But yet at the same time, it tries to ascend that by talking about angels. Actually, this song is a dedicated to Montreal, which is a city that she loves, which I find very interesting. Angel baby, you got me feeling kind of blue. Think I need you and you know the things that I would do. Everything I love is consolation after you. So tell me anything, anything you like. You're my darling girl. Tell me what's on your mind. And then she sings in that beautiful, um, post-chorus in French, je comprends, je te dis, je te dis, c'est la vie, au Montreal, pull apart. Running every light, red light, you were right, au Montreal, don't break my heart, I think I love you. It's just so simmery, and I, I think that she um, turns, you know, again, her, her very processed, but at the same time beautifully processed voice into pulse, is pulsating rhythm and beat that just, it carries so beautifully. And it's feather light, and yet at the same time, the production is anything but. And I think that juxtaposition is carried through beautifully. Um, I, I always wanted a music video for this song just because I could see a great dance sequence to it, because it does have that need to be choreographed sort of dance structure that I think Grimes could pull off really well. But at the same time, maybe I think she won't because, I mean, it's obviously the cycle of the album's already ended. Um, because she just sort of feels like maybe it would come off as too cheesy. I could see her fearing that, but I don't mind a little bit of cheesy. Cheesiness with a wink and a hint of deeper subtext. So we come to one of the first sort of more stripped back and slower tempoed songs easily. She has said that this is her least favorite track on the album, and I could agree with her on that, although I actually think Pin is my least favorite. Um, this song isn't as memorable as the others, and I do feel like it's, it's trying to be a little bit more of a ballad, but I feel like her piano delivery is a little lackluster. And although I could see it as sort of coming off as sort of more of a gesture, a jovial kind of carnival-like sound that could apply to that sort of creepy clown, all of that kind of aesthetic that goes into her music, I just don't think it's carried through very well. I think the song starts to become a little different and interesting when it starts to become more of an experimental um, violin mixed with electronic Tronica sort of break down towards the end. And this is the first time we really get the violin and strings incorporated, which is something that she always incorporated on Visions and I thought really served very well because it was these beautiful orchestral elements that were warped and you used as sort of these outros and intros to set the mood and tone. Thematically, the song basically is about how, you know, people will be attracted to her because of her success or her image, but they just, they take advantage of her you know, three years later and now you want to call? Yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, you you weren't there for me when I really needed you. You just wanted me to benefit you. I was, I was just a convenient thing for you. I wasn't actually something important. I was used. I want to reference the artwork that Grimes made for a lot of these songs, and particularly with the song Pin, because I think it adds a lot more interest and intrigue into the song. She drew a monkey, a killer whale, and an eagle. And then there's also the word fairy in bold. And then she also has fairy written in Japanese. And then she also has pin written in the very bottom. I think this song has potential when it starts out in the verses, but I just don't really feel the chorus so strongly. Um, I feel like the problem with this sound is that if it works really well, it works. And then it doesn't quite make it. If it doesn't soar with a nice catchy hook, it sort of falls a little bit flat. Though, don't get me wrong, I love all of these songs. I think they flow very beautifully into this cohesive record. But Pin and Easily are songs that I won't really listen to unless I'm listening to the whole record full way through. And the idea of Pin is basically, you know, being a pin, I'll stick to you forever. Because this scar, I think, is per permanent. I love it when she sings, Kiss me with a big knife, bloody heart of paradise. Living like a soldier, peace of mind must be nice. That's a real jab at some sort of backstabbing, you know, trifling going on there. And then at the end of this, when it sounds like everything is falling down, she admits that she actually still needs this guy. She feels so like she just keeps coming back to him. The gravitational pull is so strong. Thought I had won. I thought I won till I lost. And I fixing my fall, but for what cost? And I see a reflection when I look at mine and I say, baby, don't go away. 
Okay, we have reality where we don't capitalize the I's in the song. Reality was a demo that was released months and months ahead of this album that immediately got me so excited and critics everywhere were raving about it. She called it this unfinished demo that wouldn't sound any good. And I was like, no, this is an exquisite track. Like you really need to, you need to put this on the album. And that's why she did is she reworked it. I have to be honest though. I really do recommend you listen to that unre- that demo version that was released months in advance because I actually feel like in most aspects, the album version is not as nice. It's not as airy and there's not as much of that sort of bass grooving synth. It, it's kind of all a little bit more swirled up in that electronica, which does thematically make it fit and match the sound. I mean, again, she really kind of does brand her sound very well and very seamlessly throughout all the production of this album. And I can see why she wants to kind of give it that um, update and refurbish because it needs to fit on this record somehow. But I do feel like it benefited from being a little bit more spaced out and a little bit more ambient and a little trippier. And I do find that a little bit lacking. Um, But again, if I hadn't heard the demo initially, I would still have fallen in love with it because when it crashes down to that chorus and it gets that deep house sound, because it's very house inspired, you know, I mean, it's just undeniable. It's like so good. And of course, the lyrics describe, I think, anyone who has depression, who views the world and is just like, why do I get up every day? Oh, baby, every morning there are mountains to climb, taking all my time. When I get up, this is what I see. Welcome to reality. The monotony of life can become so overbearing and crushing um, every single day. Everything is the same. And this song is trying to break through that and trying to reconcile all of that kind of depressive energy and express it through dance and through something that could come across as actually hopeful. So I don't necessarily find this the saddest or darkest song thematically because there's all this hope that's tied into it. It's just asking for a little bit of help. It's asking for a sign from the universe um, because, you know, it, it takes a lot to change your reality and your mind needs to be in the right place. And it, it's looking inwards and it's realizing how is your reality matching what's going on inside? What, what do you need to think about and change in your thought process it self-reflects, I think, really beautifully. It doesn't ask too many questions. Um, it just just sort of states that kind of sympathetic of like, this is how it is and it sucks. But like, I'm going to be okay at the end. World Princess Part 2. I'm not a song I'm too keen on. There's definitely this video game um, sound effects that's incorporated and this like really crushing um, synth work that that I think is a little overdone. But I, at the same time, I appreciate that it is, again, playing that bubblegum goth aesthetic of like a princess, like Princess Peach, I always envision her, or Princess Zelda from Legend of Zelda. I know Grimes is a big Legend of Zelda fan. Um, there's a song called World Princess on one of her debut albums, How Faxa, so that's why this is part two. And basically, she has called the princess one of her closest friends who she's inspired by um, into writing a lot of her music. And yeah, you do understand that there's a little bit of that feminist, I'm gonna do what I want. I kind of think you sucked the life right out of the room. I know most likely how I used to be a frail and silly thought in your mind, but don't be unkind, you're so far behind me. There's this proclamation of self-determination, it's mine, she cries in the chorus. But then it gets really, really, um, really dark at the very end in the outro. As, as the groove kind of dims down, we have this, if I stare into the darkness, I won't know where I am. I haven't seen daylight since I started giving in. My eyes are falling heavy. My feet are moving slow. But there's all this second guessing. It's kind of the darker underbelly kind of reveals itself underneath this sort of, I think, overly bouncy and playful experimental um, sonic structure. Venus Fly. It's not Venus Fly Trap, which we all know is this, you know, really toxic um, uh, predatory plant in the rainforests. This song is badass. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it is the ballsiest track on this record, along with Kill V. Mame. The artwork is unapologetically dark and disgusting because I think it's basically flipping and it's asserting itself and crushing beauty standards and objectification on women, um, using these as weapons to sort of attack back at the male gaze and that's this song is like weaponized to do that and i think it's so beautifully done she employs janelle monet who's 
a beautifully crafty experimental pop singer, and she com contributes into the sort of pre-choruses. Why are you looking at me now? What if I pulled my teeth, cut my hair underneath my chin, wrap my curls all around the world, throw my pearls all across the floor, feeling my beat like a sniper girl, because I want it more. You know, what if I let my real true unshaven armpit beauty upon you? What would you think? Would you see me have find me beautiful? Do I have to wear all this makeup and look a certain way, a certain Eurocentric sort of way with the long straight hair? What if I have these curls? What if I can't control that? You know, and you're in the club. Why are you looking at me? And it's it's that sort of aesthetic. It's It's like this song wants to have so much fun at a party, but then it's also like directly addressing this really important feminist issue of female objectification and harassment. Because she's saying, why are you looking at me? Why are you, why are you talking smack behind my back? When it breaks down to the post-chorus break dubstep craziness, it was just like one of those moments where you're just like, oh my God, the song just is so electronic. And I, I think it really is just, I, I, again, I use this term heavy metal electronica and I think that, you know, I was just reviewing Bjork's music and I feel like there's some songs on Bjork's new record that this song is sort of in the same aesthetic. Um, it's, it's catchy and danceable, but it's not dance music like you're used to hearing it. It's very unnerving and unconventional and it like, makes you feel uneasy, but at the same time, you just want to dance your ass off. And I find like this being one of the most energetic dance breakdowns I've actually ever heard in a trance sort of inspired dance pop song in a long time. And I just will always sort of love the energy and the urgency of this song. It's just so dire. It's so pleading and it's so overt and extroverted. I just, I love it. And then she employs the violins in the back and that breakdown, it just adds that sort of melancholic kind of gothic twist to sort of cherry on top at the end with the dogs barking. It's just all those aesthetics that you're used to with Grimes from like her earlier work. And then she just sort of plops it at the end to just sort of summarize that. Again, there's dark subtext to a lot of these pop or dance trance hooks that she's employing. Life in the Vivid Dream is a nice sort of interlude song. I wish it was longer because it just provides so much levity. I mean, especially after Venus Fly, she has these Enya-like vocals that are so soft and simmery and go all over the place. And you feel like it's a rainy day and it's reflecting on the environment and how we torture it and destroy it. The artwork that she made kind of depicts that as well. Again, I love all the artwork. I highly recommend checking out all of these original drawings that she created for each and every song on this record because they are all exquisite. And um, this, this song just sort of beautifully sort of seeks into the final track, which is Butterfly. The music video for this is one of my favorites she has ever done and one of my favorite minis videos. It was shot in Italy with Hannah which is another, who's another experimental pop princess who is undeniably amazing. Highly recommend checking out her work as well. Butterfly is again, like you think, oh, the title is Butterfly. Oh, it starts out so sweet. And then it's like, holy crap, this can becomes this dark, soulful imbued pop house dance fest. Oh no, it came higher than an aeroplane. Don't know this song, sweeter than a sugar cane. Why are you looking for a harmony? There is harmony in everything. It's a butterfly who waits for the world. There are so many layers to this song. I can only imagine the production, how long it took to layer on top all of these vocal samplings. And oh my God, it's just insane. Um, she even says uh, in an interview with Rolling Stone that her computer continually crashed while she was making this song because of how much layering she was doing. It just like fried her hard drive. Um, the theme of this song is basic from the perspective of a butterfly in the Amazon rainforest as all the trees are being cut down. So this song and Life in the Vivid Dream employ that environmental, um, impactful need to, you know, understand the world may be falling down around us. I also see this song as also an allusion to music and how it's going to be so catchy and alluring because she does sing about, like, I don't know this song. It's so sweet. I want to, you know, know more about it. I, I do find that illusion to be in there as well. I think the environmental lyricism is so vague and obtruse that it's hard to necessarily get that from it um, without having her explain it herself because she does talk about like writing a song in the song itself. Um, so you think that it's a little bit more personal to her, but instead she's really trying to impersonify um, this environmental character who is being overrun by deforestation and man, you know, destroying their environment. Really fun song, really great way to end this album. And overall, this album is just 
a undeniably bizarre, but not too bizarre. This is definitely more of an accessible Grimes for sure, which some people will not like. Some people are too hipster, and I must admit they need to get over themselves because I really hate how like there are some people who will just, if a song has like a really conventional or maybe a little bit of an earworm type hook, they kind of get turned off by it because they're like, oh, that's like lame. That's like easy way out sort of stuff. Like that's just pop music. I need something that's jarring and that's weird and just cacophonous. And I'm like, that's not fun to listen to though. Sure, it makes for great abstract art, but not all songs need to be like that. You can make abstract art out of something that's actually very mainstream. It's called pop art. And, you know, Lady Gaga does that with her art pop record. Honestly, I feel like this album is art pop. No dissing to Lady Gaga, but because that album experiments with that kind of stuff too. But if you really want to talk about art pop, let's talk about Grimes, because that is exactly what her sound is. But it's so much more than that. I don't want to categorize it as one thing. I had to review this album because I have loved Grimes for many years. I'm really excited to see what she does next. I love the artwork. It's that Japanese manga aesthetic, twisted and dark and fairy tale esque Again, I highly recommend checking out her drawings because she's also a very talented artist. And I also recommend checking out Hannah, who Hannah Pestle is her name. She features in some of the music videos like for World Princess and Butterfly um, and Scream that were and Belly of the Beat as well um, that they filmed all over the world last year. So I, I and they were just shot on an iPhone. Um, her music, there's sort of this duo, I think, that really are impressive. Um, and Grimes is just so impressive. She's badass. She's unapologetic. She's she's a gender bender. She's but at the same time, she's this shy girl who doesn't want to draw too much attention to herself. But she doesn't want to be this image. She wants her art to be its own image. And in this day and age, it's really hard to sell in a pop, cate pop category like that, or even if an alternative. So I really admire her brand that she's created. I don't think we're going to hear new music for her for still quite some time. I think she did kind of want to get this album out and then kind of see where life took her. I'm not entirely sure if she wants to make music all of her life. Um, but I'm sure she will release another album sometime down the road. And I'm definitely excited to see, you know, maybe she won't go quite so pop ever again. But, you know, I again appreciate the fact that she did because, again, it makes it something that's so memorable to me. This is one of the best albums of 2015, critically acclaimed and also in my opinion. So let me know what you thought about this killer album in the comments. And I hope you enjoyed this review. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye.